Well, good evening. good evening. God's peace to you all. It is a joy to be here with you tonight. The sun's out. So thanks be to God. Lori gave the suggestion that we'll be worshiping outside tonight. So everyone, please stand and we'll... No. <laughs> it is tempting. Uh, but thanks be to God as we start getting more into the spring weather and as we enjoy that. Um, but even more of a joy, guess what? Jesus is here tonight. He's here with his gifts. He's here with his word. Everything that he has promised, that he has won and secured, he has for you here this night. So thanks be to God for that. Uh, a couple of announcements as we get going here tonight, of course. Um, as we get into May, we'll have confirmation here. It'll be on May 21st, that Sunday. Uh, the service will be at 1045. If you want to uh, come out and, and watch the service that day, give thanks to God as we see uh, six youth, uh, youth come forward and confess their faith in Christ. Um, as they've been working throughout this year in confirmation, it's always a joy to see. So you're welcome to come out for that. Um, you'll note also, if you came in, there's, an al there's aliens among us, apparently, um, with the spaceship and everything. VBS, we're getting ready for that here already. Uh, that'll be on August 7th through the 11th. There's sign-up forms. There's everything that you can see in the back. So go take a look. Uh, take the home, the forms. Give them to kids, grandkids, got neighbors, things like that. Uh, share the news as we'll be looking forward to that uh, August 7th through the 11th, so it's just a few months away now, uh, but time to get thinking on that. Um, there's that and even more, of course, on our the white insert, so if you didn't grab one on the way in tonight, um, feel free to do so on your way out because you'll see a, a ton of stuff that's coming up here this month um, as we get ready and also the calendar for the upcoming week as well if you want to stay in tune with what's going on um, at, every day here at church. Uh, so like I said, the Lord Jesus is here among us this evening. He is here with his gifts and with his sacraments for us as he supplies us, as we hear from the gospel, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and what the holy work of the Holy Spirit is to do for us, to equip us with as we engage this world uh, with the message of Christ. Uh, so with that in mind, let us now stand. Let us receive these gifts of our God as we approach him in God's service this evening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only Son to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing now our intro it responsively. Sing to the Lord a new song, Alleluia, for he has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations, Alleluia. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a 
joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Sing to the Lord a new song. Alleluia. For he has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Alleluia. We now continue by singing our Kyrie. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Comfort and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We now sing, This is the Feast.
us pray. O oh God, you make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you promise. That though many of the changes of the world, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation, please be seated tonight as we hear from the Word. Our Old Testament lesson this evening comes from the prophet Isaiah, the 12th chapter. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away, that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout! Sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Together we say the Alleluia verse. Alleluia! The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Alleluia! We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Alleluia. Our epistle reading this night comes from James' letter to the church, chapter 1. St. James writes, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness that God requires. Therefore, put away all filthiness and all rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Out of reverence for Christ, as we are able, let us now rise as we hear his word and begin first by singing the Alleluia in verse. chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, But now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, Where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. 
concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation, please be seated as we sing our sermon hymn today, hymn 556, Dear Christians, One and All, Rejoice.
Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. But from our gospel text today, we should also say this. Alleluia, the helper has come. He has come indeed. Alleluia. I thought I might get you with that one. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, it is a good thing indeed that Christ has sent us the helper, the Holy Spirit. For the task ahead of us require his help. For Jesus tells us this, when the Helper comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. With these words, Jesus summarizes for us the threefold work of the Holy Spirit. But I find that these translations put the work mildly. They say in summary that the Holy Spirit will convict the world concerning these three things. But the Greek text that Jesus has and uses, the word here is actually a bit harsher. It's not convict. The word would ring closer in our ears to hear that the Holy Spirit comes to expose the world or rebuke the world concerning these three things. It might be better to say then, in our gospel lesson today, that Jesus is telling you, his people, that the Holy Spirit comes to us to equip us as followers of Jesus in order that we might have the strength to call this world out on the rug and expose it, this world's glory, to expose and rebuke this world's power and prestige and authority as nothing as but a vain trash heap that sits on top of a house of cards, and no matter how much lipstick you put on it, that pig is still a pig. That is the job of the church to a world that has unbelief. Now hearing this, we can see that there's actually a lot to unpack in our text today. Why is Jesus saying this? Who is this Holy Spirit? What exactly does the work of the Holy Spirit mean? And what is this about sin and righteousness and judgment? This text is packed full, like a donut stuffed with jelly. So it would be helpful for us to define our terms, for the benefit for us to understand the words of our Master, Jesus Christ. John 16, it takes place on the night when Jesus was betrayed. Jesus is giving one last farewell to his disciples before he is taken away from them to complete the work of our salvation. And at the beginning of our lesson, Jesus reiterates that he's leaving. He's not staying around. He's going back to the Father from where he came. And Jesus tells his disciples at the beginning of chapter 16, in the verses that immediately happen right before our lesson today, that he says after he goes, the world will turn on Christ's people. If they treated Christ this way, how are they going to treat us? The world will hate the church. They will not bear the church's witness, nor the proclamation of the gospel. And so Jesus says to his people, he says, they will persecute you. They will throw you out of the synagogue for what you have to say. And some of them, some of them even like saw They will kill you, thinking that they are serving God by doing so. And Jesus notes that his disciples are sad upon hearing this. Jesus is leaving, and they're going to suffer from this world and from the devil, the ruler of this world, who will not stand for this message. It's not exactly what they wanted to hear. This is not exactly the the sign-on bonus when they've signed the contract with Jesus on this. But regardless of that sorrow, Jesus tells them that it is necessary that he goes away. I always find that word strange. He tells them it's necessary, in fact, it's to your advantage that I have to leave, that I must not be seen anymore. Because Jesus, he must go to those places that are not seen by mortal eyes. Jesus must go to the place that feeds the universe. If Jesus does not go back to the Father, 
then the work of our salvation is not completed. If Jesus does not ascend physically back into heaven and instead would stay here on earth, then heaven could not receive us. And when our loved ones die in the faith, there would be no hope for them. Jesus goes into heaven to inaugurate his kingdom and to rule over the cosmos, to spread his righteousness across the earth. If Jesus stayed here, if he just kept on living on this earth for the 2,000 years that have gone on since, he would be trapped and located to one time and one place, and he would become irrelevant, even for a dead man risen from the dead. But if Jesus goes away, back to the Father, to the place beyond all places, Jesus can rule. He can oversee all of his creation. And he can rule it on behalf of the church. So, it is to our advantage that Jesus left and returned to the Father. It's actually good that Jesus did not stay here, but he will come again in glory on the last day. For since Jesus Christ has returned to the Father, he tells us that he can send to us the Helper. Now this word that Jesus calls the Helper, Greek is called the paraclete, and it's a major word that's used throughout the New Testament. The word used by Jesus and St. Paul and St. John is a word for the Holy Spirit. And just as Eve was created to help Adam, so to the Holy Spirit is given to help the church. Now right away, notice how Jesus describes the Holy Spirit in our text tonight. Jesus says this in verse 7. He says, but if I go, I will send him to you. This tells us right away that the Holy Spirit isn't a force. The Holy Spirit isn't some energy that you tap into. The Holy Spirit's not a feeling you get about this or that. Jesus characterizes the Holy Spirit as a person. The Holy Spirit is not an it, but a him. The Holy Spirit is not a what, but a who. Just like Jesus, just like the Father, the Holy Spirit has his own thoughts, his own will, his own being that are in sync with the Father and with the Son. In fact, the Holy Spirit, he says, comes to take all of Jesus' stuff that he has won for us and to actually give it to us. Now, saying this seems like a, well, of course, pastor point. But this point that the Holy Spirit is a person and not some impersonal force should be noted with great care. Because much of popular Christian practice today treats the Holy Spirit like how the Jedi and Sith in Star Wars talk about the Force, or like how Buddhists in Eastern religions talk about Brahman. The Holy Spirit is not a creative energy that binds all living things together that we need to just somehow tap into. But yet, that is how many Christians treat the Holy Spirit today in their practice and in their theology. And, on top of it, the rise of paganism and the occult in the last century has also seeped deeply into the church's thoughts and assumptions about the Holy Spirit. In fact, a premise that paganism and the occult believes is that the spiritual world is something that we can tap into and use if we apply the right method to do it. Now often this is achieved in pagan thought and the occult with praise and worship, thinking that this will summon God because he cannot resist our praise. It's that theological basis for Pentecostal worship, in fact, that over the last century has seeped into every Christian denomination by means of worship. Over the last 100 years, the spirit of Pentecostalism treats the Holy Spirit as some sort of divine energy or power that music and song tap us into and then ushers us into 
God's presence. It's exactly how they talk about it. In fact, that's a paganism pig with Christian chapstick on it. In fact, Bethel's own description and purpose of their music in their own words is to say, at every worship service, our worship teams usher in the presence of God. Or take Hillsong, which says that their purpose is to serve the global church to equip believers everywhere with songs of Holy Spirit power. That's a different kind of God being discussed there. That's a different spirit than the Holy Spirit that Jesus says he will give to his people. The Holy Spirit that Jesus says he is giving to his church will be given to rebuke the world concerning three things, sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, of course, after learning about the Holy Spirit, we need to define what we mean when we say the world. The world that Jesus is talking about here is everything that opposes him and his rule. The world is always that which is in rebellion against its creator. The devil, unbelievers, all of that which is in the world oppose and opposes Christ. So tonight, Jesus is not talking to you with these words. You are his sheep. You belong to Jesus. You are in the world, but you're not of the world, as Jesus would say. Now, if you're here tonight, and you don't happen to believe in Christ, then Jesus is talking to you. But I'm assuming that each one of you are here today because Jesus is your Lord. Jesus is taking his aim with his words on a world that continues to reject him and continues to reject the message that Christ is bringing through his church. So Jesus may not be talking to us with these words, but these words from Jesus are given to us for our comfort and for our benefit and for the sake of our mission. And so we should take note of each of these words. The first word of rebuke by the Holy Spirit to the world concerns sin. The Holy Spirit makes the world aware of sin because they do not believe in Jesus, according to Christ's own word. This is the sin that will condemn people to hell for all eternity. The sin of the world is not believing in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And notice with this, that with this, God levels the playing field for everyone. God makes all people into sinners, not because of good or bad behavior or what is done in life, but because whether or not they hold on to Christ. God puts everyone under condemnation with his law in order that he might have mercy on all people through Christ. That's what Paul says in Galatians. So people who live a blameless life and who are good and moral people, indeed they are so, they are yet subject to God's wrath and eternal damnation if they reject Christ. This is what we call the scandal of faith alone. So, why would God send good people to hell? It's not because good people do not live a good life. In fact, I hope you all are striving to be really good people too, to benefit this world because it needs it. To live perfectly according to God's Ten Commandments. That's the mind here. Which Remember also, since none of us have done this blamelessly besides Christ, we would all be doomed if salvation was not by faith in Christ. A good person, though, a good person is an excellent gift for life in this world. But do take note, a good person is only good for life in this world. The world that Jesus is bringing is something completely different entirely. Good people go to hell when they do not trust in Jesus Christ for their righteousness and in their standing before God. In fact, rejecting Jesus is a sign that the root of the tree is bad and the fruits that appear outwardly good on the tree are actually evil. Because the good deeds that are done in this life, if they're done out of spite for Christ, not because of him, It proves that these good works are, in fact, evil. 
It is not a sin to be a good person, but God has a different standard of righteousness that prevails before Him, and that is faith in Christ. That is the scandal of the cross. That is the foolishness of God by which we are saved. Foolishness to the world, but as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, the power of salvation for all who believe. So, indeed, you better live a good and upright life in this life to give a witness to how God has created the universe as it is expressed in the Ten Commandments because the Ten Commandments are no different than the laws of gravity, than the laws of thermodynamics. It's just how things are. And that's all well and good. But the righteousness, that's something that only works down here on earth below. That won't get you anywhere before God in heaven above. Because that's what you're expected to do. If there's no faith in Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. Jesus judges on a different scale of righteousness. So at the end of the day, when the Holy Spirit comes to rebuke the world concerning sin, the sin that Jesus has in mind here is defined as whether or not you believe in Jesus Christ to be your righteousness because you have none of your own. There's a great difference between a good person and a Christian. Because you can do everything right. You can do everything right on the surface. You can do everything right in the eyes of the world. You can appear good, and yet inwardly, you can hate God's law and try to work against it even when you do good things. People, I hear it all the time, even Christians, they'll say this about God's. When I ask them, why does God give the Ten Commandments? An answer I sometimes and often get is, It prevents me from doing what I really want to do. Oh, we do want to do evil. The law prevents me from doing what I really want. That's why we end up making more laws in this country. Because ten are not enough. If men will not be ruled by ten commandments, neither will they be ruled by ten thousand. So with these words, we discover that even if we keep the law perfectly on the surface, deep down, we despise it. God, of course... He found a remedy to this problem because he sent forth his son. Jesus who kept the law perfectly and shed his blood. He was the perfect spotless lamb offered for you and for me, for the sins of the whole world, that he might bring us life and light, and indeed he has to you. But when the world rejects that message, all that's left is sin. The Holy Spirit that Jesus sends to us makes that known to us. Outside of Christ, there is no salvation. So with that, we see an implication for us as God's people. God has not made this congregation here at Christ Lutheran just to make good and moral people. That can be done in a lot of places on earth. That's a nice side quest that we should be engaged in, but it's not the point of our existence. The church is in the business of making people righteous before God. That's why the Holy Spirit is given to help. This can only be received by faith, given to us by the Holy Spirit, and by the Holy Spirit who gives us the righteousness of Jesus. And that leads us into that second word. After we become aware of our sin, the world does not know sin. It thinks it knows about the external matters, and so it never sees the benefit of Jesus Christ. You know, the world never sees worth in hearing God's word, what you're doing right now. It never sees the benefit of receiving the forgiveness of sins or partaking of the sacrament where we receive the gifts that the Holy Spirit declares to us the work of Jesus to us. And that leads us to that second word. That second word of rebuke to the world concerning righteousness. Because Jesus goes to the Father and you will see me no more, he says. What Jesus means here is this. You can be certain of your righteousness because Jesus cannot be seen. It's perhaps a strange way to think about it. If the first point riles people up, this one will make them think we are raving mad. In Jesus alone is our righteousness. And where is Jesus? He is before heaven pleading our case to the Father. He goes to the Father, having paid for the sins of the whole world, that we might right now have confidence to draw near to 
God. Jesus brings all of his work that he did for us, and he brings it to the Father who accepts that sacrifice and then dishes out the Holy Spirit to us in order that we might receive these benefits all in the name of Jesus Christ. So once we're made aware of sin, seeing that even our best lives and even the best versions of ourselves that we conjure up in our minds is all under sin, we come to find out that our righteousness is in the Lord Jesus Christ, who goes before the Father and who's veiled before our eyes. Jesus is away on business, bringing our case before the Father, acquitting us of all sin, and making us righteous before God. You can't take your righteousness before God, but Jesus went into heaven to present himself to God for you. Christian righteousness before God means that Jesus goes to the Father having done everything that he has done for you, to reconcile you and me to the Father, that for the sake of Christ, we are righteous, not from our own merit, not from our own ability, but only because Jesus loves you. That is all that can make you good, all that can make you righteous before God, and it is enough. It is finished, after all. Our hearts must be taught this by the Holy Spirit, to see and to know sin, to see that of ourselves there is no chance. It is impossible for man, but not for God. All things are possible with God, and so is your righteousness. This can only be received by faith and in trust in Christ. All of our deeds and righteousness that go, cannot go before him, but Jesus does. And lastly, that leads us to the third word of rebuke by the Holy Spirit to the world, judgment. The Holy Spirit comes to rebuke the world concerning judgment because as Jesus says, the ruler of this world is judged. Judgment here is meant by a verdict. All the unbelief of the world has a source, a fountainhead, you might say. And the source of, of that is the ruler of this world, Satan. The reason why the world rejects the Holy Spirit's message of sin and righteousness is because the ruler of this world blinds them. But Jesus has overthrown him. When this world rebelled and Adam sinned, it fell under the power of the evil one. The devil does indeed rule the world and therefore prevents and fights against Jesus Christ. So when this world persecutes Christians, when it belittles you, the devil is at work through them to hinder, destroy, and snatch away the Holy Spirit, work of the Holy Spirit if he can. But the Holy Spirit's third rebuke is the promise that the church belongs to Christ and will overcome. Because Christ has triumphed over the world himself. Jesus Christ has rendered a judgment over the rebellious world that opposes him and of its ruler. The execution of that judgment still awaits when Jesus comes again, but he will execute it. Though through this world, though the world and the devil oppose Christ, though they afflict you as Christians, and through all sorts of suffering and loss, we are guaranteed that the rage against Christ's church, it will fail because Jesus has pronounced a verdict upon the devil, all his fallen hosts, and all who oppose him and side with him. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. More that even could be said than we have said tonight. And that is the witness of the church to the world. It is here to make this world, to rebuke it, to call it into faith in Christ. And the Holy Spirit will help us in that task. The Holy Spirit will declare to us all truth, for Christ's word is truth. The Holy Spirit does not do his own thing. He's always pointing us to Jesus. So if the Holy Spirit is not pointing you to Jesus Christ and to the gifts that he has won for you, then you do not have the Holy Spirit, but a demonic spirit. Test the spirits. But Jesus Christ he will be glorified in our midst whenever the word of Christ is proclaimed, whenever the sacrament is given, and whenever faith clings to him. 
That's how the Holy Spirit works, to convert us that Jesus delivers to you his promise, that he strengthens us to be faithful in this world, and he prepares us to receive Jesus when he comes again in glory. May that word from Jesus strengthen and keep his one true church on earth and continue to forge us into the people that we need to be to be ready for the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. The grace of your Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, your Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Now let us continue by confessing our faith in who God is and what he has done for us by speaking the Apostles' Creed. Please stand as we confess our one true faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Congregation, please be seated. At this time we will present our offerings that we collected before service as we present them to our Lord and as we sing our offertory. continue with our prayers as we bring our cares and petitions to our Father in heaven who hears us because of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Dear God, Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name would be kept holy by us and in all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and in the fervent love that we show forth in our lives. Graciously turn us from all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, that by faith the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your Spirit, according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our wills may be crucified daily, that they may be sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Dear Father, into your merciful hands we commend all whom we pray this night, all who depend upon you, especially Mary, Sandy, Leah, Olivia, Julie, Ardell, Tammy, Jerome, Akari, Allie, Doug, for Pastor Matthew Wood and his family, for our seminarian, Christopher Shearman and his family, for Sharon and Gary, Joan and Alice, Mary and Linda, for Chris and Wilmer, and for Ron. Lord, we ask that you'd be with all of our armed forces here and scattered abroad, that you would grant them peace and that you would bring them home safely to their loved ones, especially those who serve in our armed forces from our congregation, for Daniel and Hunter. 
Lord, we ask you to be with all those women who are pregnant, that you would sustain and keep them, to bring them to term, to keep them and their unborn children safe, and to provide for all of their needs, for Claudia and Katie and Barb. And Lord, we give thanks for the continued healing of Dale, that you would continue to bless and guide and keep him, that he might give thanks to you all of his days. Lord, in your mercy, give us this day our daily bread. Preserve us also from greed and from selfish cares, and help us to trust in you to provide for every single one of our needs. Lord, in your mercy, forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us, that our hearts may be at peace, that we might rejoice in a good conscience before you, and that no sin would ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy, lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. And lastly, dear Father, deliver us from all evil, body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and to answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing the last five verses of our hymn, Hymn 556, Dear Christians, One and All, Rejoice. <laughs> 